Fort Fidus was known to me. It had once been situated on an isolated coastal elevation by the secluded backdrop of Culloken Bay, several miles to the east of St. John's. Only the foundations of the age-old fort remained, or more accurately, a series of sunken ditches and earthen banks that spread unevenly over the windswept territory. I had deduced that the opening to the underworld mentioned in the tablet of St. John's was a reference to an adjacent topographical feature, an entrance to an unexplored cave system that lay close to Fort Fidus, called Hell's Lum. I had determined to make my way to Hell's Lum with the intention of entering the cave system through its narrow opening, which was exceedingly steep in its decline and exceptionally foreboding. It was a maneuver that involved a high degree of risk, but with my slightly oil lamp lighting the way, I was undeterred, and more certain than ever that my predecessor, Dr. Marion Tachnassus, had come this way before me. In spite of the numinous glow of my oil lamp, the roughness of the cabin floor was difficult to negotiate. A flurry of shadows interfered with my passage, impeding my vision as I struggled over the corrugations of the rock, slipping on occasions because of the wet surface of the interior. Within half an hour of my traversal, at a point in the passage where it widened into a more openly proportioned cavernous space, the inner structure flattened out, and I came across a discarded haversack resting against the cavern wall. It looked as it had been there for years, and so it proved. A quick survey of its contents revealed several ledgers that bore the simple inscription and handwriting I recognized. Dr. Marion Tachnassus, Department of Anthropology, Harvard University. Notes and observations, 1930 to 31. So, she had indeed been here before me, and she had followed the passages of exposition to the singular destination of clandestine darkness. But what of the haversack? Why was it here? It seemed to me that she had paused to take rest, that she had removed the haversack and lain it against the cavern wall, and then, what? I had no way of knowing. I delved into the ledgers somewhat frantically to see if I could find any indication of her whereabouts. The pages were wet and damaged through time, some of them disintegrating as I turned them. Little of what they contained was now legible, but I came across several extracts that revealed matters of exceptional interest, perhaps more so than my sanity could bear, for such was the astonishment I felt upon reading them. One paragraph said, I have since devised a methodology for interpreting the Pictish Ogham, a cipher based on a process of mathematical elimination and the identification of associative clusters. I have applied the same methodology to the orthography of the Krithrahin, which has proven more difficult to unlock. However, the name itself, Krithrahin, appears to me to be a Pictish adaptation or translation of the name they have given themselves, which I believe to mean from a distant brightness, or to put it another way, from a distant star. Hence, the Pictish name for them, the star people. Another passage read, I have found examples of the Pictish organ, mainly from stones in the north, which refer to rituals that involve the transmutation of celebrants into beasts, denizens, or multifaceted organisms. There is no mention of lotus eating or of hallucinogenic inducements to account for the spectacle. I am therefore compelled to look at other evidence to come to a proper scientific understanding of what this means. My own thoughts drifted, not unreasonably, to the ancient symbol stones of the Picts, the unusual carvings of cosmic phenomena, and the many depictions of strange and often unworldly creatures humans with the heads of birds, unrecognized species, odd chimeras consisting of physical features seemingly plucked at random, evidence perhaps of shape-shifting, of mutable life forms and maneuverable entities of flesh, perhaps engaged in flights of imitation or replication or crude adjustments to habitats requiring a radical adaptation of their metabolisms to new conditions. <laughs> 